Augustana Luther Leaguers made history in Boston, Cradle of American Liberty, June 24 through 28, 1953. The glorious theme, Christ Makes Men Free. For two whole years in advance, these committee chairmen and their 30 different committees, totaling hundreds of energetic New Englanders, were hard at work under the direction of Pastor N. Eugene Larson, General Chairman, making countless plans for the Boston Freedom Conference. Most important of all was the prayer preparation. Hundreds of prayer cells met regularly. In fact, the entire Augustana Lutheran Church joined in prayer. Now, two Luther Leaguers, a lute and a Lou, will help me bring this wonderful story to you. Way down south in Texas, out west in California, up north in Canada, all over the country, we Leaguers started a great mass movement eastward. Why, we traveled to Boston using every possible mode of transportation. Most delegates came in chartered buses. I know a fellow who hitchhiked. He said the miles to Boston grew longer and longer. Every foot became an acre. We wanted to tell the world where we were going. And so when we plastered the car with signs, why, even Dad didn't mind too much. Believe me, it was really crowded and noisy, too, down at the railroad station when we left. There were three special trains from the Pacific Northwest, from Chicago, and from Minnesota. Sunday morning, we sang hymns and worshiped God on the train, just as we would be doing in our churches back home. Hear ye. Journeying to and from Boston was a trip of a lifetime for leaguers. I'll say, in Washington, D.C., what a thrill it was to tour the Capitol building. We watched the changing of the guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, climbed the steps to the Lincoln Memorial, and swarmed all over the beautiful grounds at Mount Vernon. I'll never forget that first breathtaking sight of the New York City skyline. Here ye. Buses by the dozens rolled up to Mechanics Building, headquarters for the convention on opening day, June 24. The registration total, 5,400 delegates from 33 states, from Canada, and from seven foreign countries. 325 Johnsons registered. And believe it or not, there were a few Murphys and O'Briens, too. What an amazing variety of distinctive headgear. These straw sombreros came all the way from California. Illinoisites wore railroad engineers' hats and scarves. New Englanders had a real run on their three-cornered colonial hats. I met some Cleveland Indians. And it wasn't hard to guess that these leaguers hailed from the nation's capital. Texans in 10-gallon hats sat down to inspect our striking convention kits, containing attractive literature from all areas of our church's life, plus a copy of the convention daily paper, The Town Crier. I liked the bright red, white, and blue pocket-sized program booklet. There was a letter from President Eisenhower inside. We wrote our names on our badges and fastened them to our lapels with a beautiful metal convention pin, a Luther rose upon a cross. 2,000 of us arrived early enough to take an ocean cruise and send hymns ringing across the waves. How amazed the fishermen were. Hear ye. Leaguers filled the mechanics auditorium for the opening service on Wednesday night. Those convention song leaders, that wonderful team of brothers, pastors John and Robert Pearson, led an enthusiastic hymn sing. And suddenly... The trumpeters heralded the great moment everyone was waiting for. The Freedom Conference had begun. Dr. Eskel England, president of the New England Conference, officially welcomed the delegates. Then, Pastor N. Eugene Larson, assisted by a splendid voice choir backstage, began to tell us a thrilling freedom story. 
were we surprised when an amazing series of tableaus unfolded before our eyes. We saw Martin Luther, who stood before princes and emperors in his struggle for freedom of faith. We saw our country's forefathers creating political freedom in the Declaration of Independence. We saw one of the millions of youth in Eastern Europe suffering under a godless communistic government. And at last we saw the cross of Christ, which calls every man to the only true freedom. What a magnificent introduction this was to our inspiring theme, Christ Makes Men Free. You know, over and over again during the convention, when I saw that big auditorium just packed to the rafters, right up to the ceiling with thousands of leaguers just like me from all over this continent, any feelings that I might have had that my church and my league back home are little stuff just seemed to vanish into thin air. Wasn't the auditorium beautifully decorated? Gold-colored curtains framed the stage, and stretching above the whole setting was our theme. Center of all attention was the 12-foot cross, lighted in a different color each evening. On either side of the cross stood 13 banners of the 13 Conference Luther Leagues. I'll never forget how quiet it was when Dr. Wilton Bergstrand, our youth director, delivered that tremendous keynote message the price of freedom. He said, apart from Christ, we're slaves to sin. We can't release ourselves, but we can change masters. Then Jesus Christ, the only really free person in the world, will unshackle us and set us free. During that service, the cross was read for divine sacrifice. At the Get Acquainted Hour following the opening rally, those Lynn, Massachusetts leaguers dressed as pilgrims and Indians and presented a very clever, original skit. Our youth directors were honored with special gifts, a codfish for Dr. Bergstrand and a lobster for Pastor Carl Manfred. Hear ye. Boston was truly a youth conference. The voices of youth rang out at every session when leaguers participated on the program as speakers, discussion leaders, panel members, worship leaders. Each morning at 7, the oldest church bells in the country called us to worship at historic Old North Church. In this very tower hung the two lanterns which signaled Paul Revere to begin his famous ride. All the services at Old North Church were conducted by leaguers devotions, music, meditations, on the theme, My Christ and My Country. Leaguers started off the daily program at Mechanics Building, too, four of them leading morning devotions. It was really impressive to hear young people our own age give such glad witness to their faith. It makes you sit up and take notice when fellow leaguers tell what they believe. Boston was truly an international conference. A special treat each day was surprise time when Dr. Bergstrand introduced various overseas visitors, such as Miss Yumiko Kagawa from Japan. You know, it seemed like there were hundreds of us shutterbugs forever clicking our cameras, and we got some good shots of overseas delegates from China, Sweden, and Finland. After every session, we mobbed speakers, such as Dr. Hans Lilja, for autographs. What an answer to prayer it was that Dr. Lilja, president of the Lutheran World Federation, Bishop of Hanover, one of the busiest churchmen of Europe, a world-renowned Christian leader, should come all the way from Germany to be with us. Our first sight of Dr. Lilja was on opening night, when he was presented with a three-cornered colonial hat and clamped it squarely on his head. All through the conference, he charmed us with his sense of humor, and he was so friendly. One leaguer said, Dr. Lilia was the biggest thing that happened to us at Boston. He just walked right into our hearts. During a directed interview, 
Dr. Lilia told us the lessons he learned while he was a prisoner of the Nazis during World War II. We learned that it really costs something for a youth to stand up for his Christian faith in Eastern Europe today. When Dr. Lilia and two students from Germany conducted a panel on the youth of Europe. One morning, Dr. Lilia met for breakfast with the Luther League Council. You know, for four busy days before our Freedom Conference began, these officers had been on deck in Boston making plans for the ongoing work of our Augustana Luther League. At the church staff workers' luncheon, there were a number of special guests. Among them, Dr. Lilia, Dr. Oscar Benson, president of our church, and Pastor Leslie Conrad, executive secretary of the Luther League of the United Lutheran Church. Hear ye. 25 different forum hours had topics tailor-made to youth's interests and needs. There were forums on Luther League work, projects, programs, Bible study. Discussion groups for counselors and pastors, too. You see, several hundred counselors, parents, and pastors accompanied their youth to Boston. Vocational forums were overflowing on the ministry, the diaconate, parish work, social work, and missions. Say, if I ever wanted to be in five different places at once, it was when forum time rolled around each morning and afternoon. It was tough to make a choice. I'd like to have participated in them all, on going to college, or into the service, on mixed marriages, freedom from slavery to bad habits, Christian citizenship. Dr. James Robinson, famous New York City pastor, delivered a stirring form time address. Herbert Philbrick, counter-spy for the FBI, asked us, shouldn't we who have the answers to communism in Christ outlive the dedication and earnestness of the communists? A favorite speaker for everybody was dynamic Mrs. Clarence T. Nelson. She's got teenagers of her own, and what she had to say about the Christian home really hit home. Here he is. Through Bible study and inspirational hours, leaguers learn more about freedom. Dr. Samuel Miller, Bible teacher, made the Word of God live for young people each morning. Like the rays of the sun streaming down from heaven, the light of God's Word shone into their hearts. I love the Augustana Lutheran Church, was the topic of speaker Dr. Thorsten Gustafson, president of the New York Conference. Dr. Malvin Lundeen, Vice President of our church spoke on, I love that church back home. At the Luther League Hour, while a leaguer narrated, a series of tableaus revealed the boundless opportunities and activities of a local league. Leadership school, Easter Gospel Project, daily devotions using the Uniting Word, programs with a punch, wholesome recreation. Hear ye. Early American history came alive for leaguers during sightseeing time every afternoon when they visited the freedom shrines of our nation. The first day, Dr. Lawson, president of Uppsala College, backgrounded the history of New England for us. We stood beside towering Bunker Hill Monument, explored old Ironsides, visited Paul Revere's home, toured Harvard University. Most of this sightseeing was done on foot. One fellow exclaimed, I haven't used a cab all week, and I've got four blisters to prove it. He was as proud of those blisters as a general is of his stars. Most of us took the driving tour through Lexington to Concord Bridge. Standing beside the Minuteman there, we paused to pray for our country and for freedom in the world. Strolling through the public gardens, we came upon some workmen putting the finishing touches on a beautiful Luther emblem, 10 feet in diameter and made of very colored plants. A popular place between sessions and during the afternoons was the exhibit hall in Mechanics Building. 
The information booth was a very busy place. Upstairs were two quiet rooms, the wayside chapel and the counseling room. Here we could arrange to talk things over with any pastor or leader of our choice. Here he is. At evening inspirational services, youth rallied around their freedom theme. Thursday night, the cross was purple for progress, penitence, and thoughtfulness. The offertory was played by a marimba ensemble of leaguers from various parts of the country. Dr. Oscar Benson, president of our church, delivered a powerful message, the progress of freedom. And then he conducted the installation of the new Augustana Luther League officers. Mr. Carl Pearson, on the left, had made a beautiful cross from 13 pieces of wood, one piece from each of the 13 conferences. Mr. Gordon Storsley, president of the Augustana Luther League, presented the cross to Dr. Bergstrand to be kept in the Luther League office in Minneapolis. Friday night, Dr. Frederick Schatz, representing the National Lutheran Council, spoke on the theme, The Purpose of Freedom. Vic Freiburg, housing chairman, gave the offering announcement for the Luther League Missionary Project. The cross was green for growth, evangelism, and missions. The Lutheran Church is a singing church, and Boston was a musical convention. The air was filled with the music of youth. There were several family instrumental ensembles, trumpeters, the Lutheran Bible Institute Quartet, and several youth choirs like the one from Hartford District. To me, the climax of all music at Boston were those thrilling hymn sings in the evening in the Bradford Hotel lobby. That lobby was just packed to overflowing, and we sang our hearts out in praise to God. We also left musical calling cards in the public gardens and at Copley Square. Here he is. The church discovers gifted youth through the talent quest. Miss June Johnson, talent quest chairman, presented the prizes. Miss Lorraine Bergstrand presented a first place attendance award to Havens Court Leaguers, Oakland, California. This is Pastor and Mrs. Lucas and their leaguers, also from Oakland, California. They shared in the first prize attendance award. Here he is. Saturday afternoon and evening was filled with unforgettable events. The patriotic rally, the parade, a picnic on the Boston Common, and finally, the great outdoor rally at Hat Shell along the Charles River. How proudly we pledged allegiance to our God and our country at the patriotic rally. And everybody had been looking forward to hearing Norman Clayton sing. Honestly, I think we could have listened to him all day long. We stood up to applaud enthusiastically when Judge Luther Youngdahl, a former Augustana Luther Leaguer, arose to give the patriotic rally address. A group of leaguers offered prayers for our country. What fun it was to march in our huge hymn singing parade, one and one half miles through the downtown streets of Boston. New Englanders were flag bearers and California leaguers carried the ALL banner and Army Band kept us in step. Many colorful floats illustrated freedom. Freedom of worship, freedom of speech. We came down the street singing hymns at the tops of our voices, witnessing to the city and to the bystanders. An 80-year-old lady on Beacon Hill said, I've seen many parades on this street down the years, and this is the best yet. I've seen many parades with guns. This is the first I've seen for Christ. I think the biggest and grandest hymn sing of the whole convention came at the end of this parade. We massed together on the steps of the State House and joined our voices in one tremendous chorus. Those joyful hymns of adoration just echoed across the Boston Common. 
Our hearts were so full of inspiration that they were almost bursting. It just seemed that we had to tell it to the whole wide world. After the hymn sing, we streamed across the Boston Common for our picnic. And can you imagine? All of us had our box lunches within 20 minutes. You know, when we were sitting there eating together, I thought of the Bible story of how Jesus fed the 5,000 on the grassy slopes of Galilee. Newspapers all over the country carried the Associated Press story about what happened at this picnic. You see, we picked up every scrap of paper afterwards. And later when the park department crews arrived, they were absolutely astounded. Instead of their usual big cleanup job, they actually had to search for work to do. What a perfect evening it was, clear and cool, down by the Charles River when we gathered on the esplanade in front of the hat shell. As we began to sing, the golden sun slowly slipped down the sky and twilight fell all around us. These were unforgettable holy moments in God's great out of doors. The Freedom Chorus, directed by Mrs. N. Eugene Larson, just filled the hat shell. They sang a stirring anthem right in tune with our theme. God's son has made me free. Boy, they sang with such volume that the sound just seemed to bounce off the buildings three blocks away. We listened again to our friend, Dr. Hans Lilja. What is real freedom, he asked. And he shared thoughts about freedom with us which burn deep within our souls. Then Pastor Carl Manfred, chairman for the rally, surprised us. He instructed us to rise quietly and follow the glowing baton of our song leader, Pastor John Pearson. It didn't take us long to gather down by the river's edge, and soon Pastor Pearson was leading us in another thrilling hymn sing. Suddenly we stopped. Out on the river we saw a blazing cross. And then we heard singing. The cross moved toward us, and we saw that there was a boat bearing the cross, and on the boat a whole chorus of young people singing beneath the cross of Jesus. The boat nudged closer to shore, and we sang hymns antiphonally back and forth. The melodies were still ringing in our hearts when we went to our hotels that night to prepare for Sunday and Holy Communion. Sunday, the closing convention day, was a day of communion and consecration. A congregation of radiant youth dressed in their very best filled mechanics building for the largest communion service in the history of our church. Overnight, the auditorium had been transformed into a great cathedral, like music that rises higher and higher until it culminates in great chords of unsurpassed harmonious beauty. So the convention had moved from session to session until it came to this great climax. Television cameras and microphones carried the service by telecast and broadcast to all of New England. Dr. Melvin Hammerberg, president of the Board of Youth Activities, served as liturgist. The Fox Valley Luther League Chorus sang very softly hymns of invitation while youth came forward to the communion tables. 32 pastors distributed elements at four long tables which accommodated 250 at one time. Leaguers knelt with folded hands. Oftentimes lips moved in personal prayer. Here and there a tear glistened on a youthful cheek. Over and over again came those mighty words, the body of Christ given for thee, the blood of Christ shed for thee. The youth were responding to the tender, throbbing words of Dr. Lilia, who preached the communion address, telling in simple language the old, old message of sin and grace. You don't need to be a perfect saint in order to draw near to God. The closer you draw to him, the more you will realize you are far from being a saint. You are far from being a perfect man. But this is the important thing. You have to come just as you are. And when you get up from your seat and draw near, 
That's exactly what you should do. You are the right person to come, exactly as you are. And if your heart is filled with unspeakable sorrow, brother and sister, come. You are the right person to come. And if your conscience has to bear a heavy burden of guilt, speed up and come. You are the right person to be here. You are exactly the man and the woman the Lord is looking for. For the other simple thing is this. All you have to do is to stretch out your hand, to receive, to accept to take the bread of life, to accept the cup of the New Testament, just to accept him. Sunday evening at the great prayer and praise service in Trinity Church, leaguers told in glowing words what Christ had done for them at Boston and the decisions they had made. I'll never forget the stirring things that Dr. Bergstrand said at the closing consecration service. Has this convention been a success? I don't know. I will know 18 months from now when I have traveled around through the Augustana Church and met you in your home league and in your home church. If you have said yes to the voice of God and to go home and act on it, then this conference has been a success. If you fail to do that, then this conference has been a failure. For youth conference is not an end in itself, but is a means to the end that we may build stronger leagues and stronger churches back home. And where are the youth who will have a sense of urgency and a sense of mission in this hour to say that I, by the grace of God, free in Christ, will help to make men free. And young friends, will you pray that prayer with me today? God, do it again. You've done it through Moody and Brooks and those young men who started the missionary crusade here in Boston, God, do it again. I challenge you in this moment to a personal encounter with a radiant, effulgent, altogether lovely Jesus Christ. And the history made at the Freedom Conference is his story. We can sum it all up in one sentence. God's Son has made me free, free. Free, I'll live for him who died for me.